let's give these guys a, a, a warm introduction. And they're going to talk about how FIBO can be uh, used to support BCBS 239. So um, to conclude, uh, and this is a takeaway. So if you want to leave now, I don't want you to leave, but if you want to leave, this is the one thing you need to remember. Banks can demonstrate BCBS 239 compliant risk reporting without disruption by using FIBO and also semantic data virtualization technologies, which we'll be presenting. So that's the takeaway. Don't forget. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it on to Mike because he's the guy who has the finance background and I'm the technology guy. So you won't believe all the finance stuff coming from me. So I'm going to pass it on to Mike. Thanks, Juan. And uh, according to a thing there, we have half an hour. So um, thank you for your patience. We did get off to a slightly slower start. So um, let's go back in time to 2008. And in the previous talk, you heard about these things called counterparty exposures. So each bank represented by this little Doric kind of thing here has various positions, various swap trades, loans, repos, all sorts of things with various other banks. And uh, one famous point in 2008, one of them goes, I'm not going to make the noise, uh, pop. <laughs> so um, that leaves everybody wondering what their position is. And you notice a couple of those banks are looking a little bit shaky as well. Um, so it suddenly becomes kind of important to know what your position is with regard to all these other people. And here's the interesting thing. Nobody was short of data. And yet it took people weeks to find out what their exposure was. So not having enough data wasn't the problem. It's actually turned that data into something like knowledge. And that means having meaning, having some kind of common way of understanding all that data. So the, um, as, as you heard earlier as well, the uh, risk data aggregation, uh, BCBS 239 as it's called for those of us geeks that remember numbers of things, um, is the risk data aggregation reporting uh, regime that's been introduced by Basel, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision of course, um, and it requires banks, well it's an interesting thing actually, it's not like every other report where here's a list of things we'd like you to report on, please send this report. It's kind of a meta-regulation. It says, look, whatever report you're doing, and here maybe is one or two terms we'd like to see, but whatever report you're doing, we'd like a different one tomorrow. We'd like you to be able to produce different reports for the next crisis than the ones we asked for for the last crisis. And we need you to be flexible, and that means that we need you to show that you've got a solid data governance regime, solid IT architecture, and proper business management of IT. You can't just have all this data sitting on these little silos and then run around like um, whatever when suddenly we ask for a report. So really this is a requirement for uh, how you generate reports rather than a requirement for yet another data model or yet another report template or anything like that. And so BCBS 239 sets out 14 principles that essentially cover the basics of what kind of reports they want, how you govern it, how they ensure that you're actually looking at uh, the right things for risk and so on. Um, and as Elisa mentioned earlier, it identifies uh, 30 banks that are known as globally systemically important banks, or to put it in plain English, banks that are too big to fail. And they were all due to have something by January of this year, which as you heard, uh, they didn't. So they all came along with, you know, that I've been working with a lot of these guys for the last year and a half, couple of years, and they knew they wouldn't quite have whatever it was because they were still trying to find out whatever it is. And meanwhile, the domestic, the ones that are too big to fail from the point of view of one country rather than the whole global system, also need to do these kind of things in the very near future. And these are banks that are very interconnected, got a lot of capital exposures and so on. So the 14 principles, I'm not going to go through what they are, but it just gives you an idea because it's things like timeliness, adaptability, accuracy, it's all about being able to be very flexible about how you produce information in reports. And in terms of those overarching themes, it means having this kind of governance, having the right infrastructure, being able to aggregate different risk, risk data at different levels of detail and so on, and be able to um, show oversight of all that stuff. So it's not a deliverable, it's an objective. It's a way of going about this stuff. And firms need to therefore 
revisit their technology infrastructure and ensure that they have the right infrastructure, the right processes, the right architecture, so they can adequately respond. As one person put it, we don't want to solve the last crisis by sending the report that we sent in about the last, well, the next crisis, by solving, sending the report we sent in for the last crisis. So there's a couple of important concepts you have to have. You have to have the right capabilities. You have to demonstrate control, good old-fashioned quality assurance, essentially, on how you're running your data, and you have to have a control environment to do that. So what we're going to show is something that brings all that together, because you know, this is very much a business concern, having a control environment, having business oversight over information. Um, and that separates out business from IT. But what we're going to, and we'll come back to this diagram a bit later, is how the ideal for meeting this is to have something like an ontology, some knowledge base, where you can ask meaningful questions using semantic types of queries without having to create a whole extra lot of semantic data until you need to for particular reasoning applications, but instead be able to interrogate existing data sources. You heard about how many different silos there are. Some of those things might be you know, master data sources or golden copy or whatever, but being able to create adapters that let you query that stuff from the uh, uh, business level view of the meanings of things. And so for that, um, and this is really the, the, the next point I want to make. When we start looking at the governance side of things, a lot of people are saying, oh, yeah, you know, we need a glossary, we need a dictionary, we need a thesaurus, whatever that is. Um, what's interesting is when the business people are starting to say that this is what they're after, they're looking for some kind of dictionary or something, they're asking the right question. They're now saying we as the business are taking control of the meaning of stuff, that we're not seeing it as an IT problem. We know that we need to understand what it is that's in our data before we figure out how to create the reports for it. But of course, they wouldn't know, you know what, is, what we know, which is what an ontology is. That you can actually represent meaning in a formal, structured way. So when they're starting to look for glossaries and, 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 and dictionaries and terminologies and stuff, you're talking to the right people and they're asking the right question. But the answer to that question is, words are not the answer. Language is a slippery thing. People have tried for centuries to standardize on terms and say we must use, you know, the, there's a wonderful thing I saw from the 1920s the other day where people were discussing the meaning of firewall, which is ironic enough because in those days it meant just one thing. But even that, you know, nobody can agree on what one word means. And words are not the answer. You've got to have some formal principled language that talks about the concepts. And then you can add the words later and the rules and all that other stuff. And so in FIBO, we had what I call the FIBO moment, where a bunch of people who, a lot of us have been involved with a lot of other standards efforts in messaging and so on. Um, there were lots of people arguing about a term. Oh, can we call this a firewall or something else? Or you know, what are our 30 critical data elements and what should we call them? And what's a counterparty? And then Mike Atkins stood up and said, well, you know, we're not going to get any agreement about these uh, words, but what if, you know, can we agree what the concepts are? Park the words off to one side, forget those. Can we agree what are the concepts we're interested in and then come back to the words? And actually everybody could. Everybody in the room knew that they understood the concepts they were working with. And if they're told you don't have to care what you call them, then that problem goes away. And that was <coughs> the birth of the concept of FIBO and, and the need to build a business uh, resource, which is an ontology. We didn't use the word ontology at first, and then eventually we said, right, we're ready to talk about a business ontology, business meanings that are formally framed, but are business facing, and that's where we built out, and these are all the different parts of FIBO. You've seen parts of them in action. Uh, just now you saw a lot of interesting terms from the derivative space that we don't see very often. Uh, all of those things are in there in a, a, a business subject matter expert review uh, resource that we're now bringing forward into more uh, 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 semantic web friendly uh, formats. It's got all the terms for the instruments. We've got market data like pricing, yields, analytics, securities issuance processes, corporate actions, all sorts of stuff in there. So that's FIBO. Um, now what do we do with that? Here's this business facing resource, but we can make it directly work with technology. And for that I'm going to hand you back to one who will explain how. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, thank you, Mike. So um, let's talk about the technology, this, what we're calling a semantic data virtualization. So you have your underlying sources. These are your legacy relational sources and, and all probably all the conversations we've had here today, we're talking about all my data is in, in, in Oracle and so forth. And you have internal data, you also have external data you want to connect to. And then you have FIBO, or you basically have your target view of the world, right? And this is, this is what you want, is your homogeneous view of all your heterogeneous sources. And uh, a long time ago, I remember seeing something from, from Dave McComb, uh, this is basically your lingua franca. This is how I want my organization to talk. And it doesn't matter where my data is, where my sources is, how it's organized, what, how, how it's structured. I just want to be able to view it, one, have one single homogeneous view that we all agree on, and then we can have diff different mappings to those different sources. And each organization can have their own view, right? And this is the FIBO basically kind of upper ontology, upper uh, model, and then every organization can make it customized for their particular use cases. And I know that we use the word ontology here, but I mean, in my experience, I kind of stopped using it because, say, ontology and people think I'm talking about cancer and oncology. So uh, now we're, start, we're using the term enterprise knowledge graph and its graphs are now very sexy. So that's actually, so I call it, we probably, so we call it an EKG. So five, the FIBO EKG. So, so it's, it's the heartbeat of your organization, right? So what you want is that you have FIBO, right, as your ontology, as your EKG, and you want to be able to create mappings to those different sources. And, and now I can have one target view where I can now do all my questions and reports and APIs and search and create dashboards and everything. So all my applications and people just have to now worry, not worry anymore, they just have to talk that single language, which in this case is FIBO. And we're here in the finance, it's FIBO in different in scenarios, different uh, in life science, there's so many different types of EKGs and so forth. So. So in a nutshell, in the semantic data virtualization, what we want to do is that we want to be able to have an EKG that is your homogeneous view of all your heterogeneous sources, and then we want to map all your data sources to that EKG. And then we have the question of, should we translate the data in, in to, to fit this particular data model, which is a graph, and the ETL format, or do we do the no ETL approach, which is what my question is, right? To ETL or no ETL? So, um, but a little, what goes underneath the hood a little bit is, so you have your standard relational model, relational databases, and because we're using all these semantic web standards, which are RDF, OWL, Sparkle, this is all a graph data model. So really what, to, to be able to get all your, your legacy sources to work with this new semantic technology, what we essentially need to do is to map get relational data into a graph, into RDF. Now the question is how do we do that? Um, so this is actually a question that uh, when people started, RDF is pretty old. I mean, it's almost 20 years now, I think. So, uh, but around 2007 was the first time that people got together and said, all right, but we have databases in RDF. Like, how do we put those two things together? Uh, so that was actually the first meeting in 2007 that we had about that. And the result of years and years, almost five years of work after that, were two standards. Uh, one of them is called the direct mapping standard. And the other one is called R2RML, which is the RDB, Relational Database to RDF Mapping Language. And these are the two W3C semantic web standards for connecting your rela relational databases to RDF. Um, so again, as, as, as Dave was saying, I, was, I started to, uh, in this process 2007 from day one. So I've been part of the whole standards process. Uh, my whole PhD was all about this, and, and I'm one of the editors of the standards. So this has been part of my life. So now what we need to do is be able to create these mappings. So the first step is to be able to create these mappings, and then once we've created the mappings, we can use the mappings. So we need to be able to create mappings from, all, from the source to that target EKG, and the mappings are represented in this standardized language called R2RML. Now R2RML is also itself very meta, is RDF, and which means it's all declarative which I think is very, very cool because what we do and the tools presented in terms of that target model, the target EKD, so everything would be in terms of FIBO, for example. Now, in the no ETL approach, what you do is that your data stays where it is, but you're still able to access and query that data in terms of that target EKG, the target model. And then you would have wrapper systems that would do the translation from, in this case, Sparkle, and, and the query in terms of the target down to the source. So you don't have to worry about moving the data. So 
in the mapping step, it's, as you can imagine, right, you have to be able to have a, a source. Uh, then you have your, your enterprise knowledge graph, in this case could be FIBO, and then you would have a user. And then you would, the user would have to have knowledge of the source, have knowledge of, of, of the, the have business knowledge about the finance and FIBO, and say, hey, these two things come together, and I'll go a little bit more into detail about what, what kind of thoughts need to go into. So, and the thing is that you can reuse a lot of the existing expertise that you have in your organization, do, use your existing people who know SQL, who write all their existing SQL reports and stuff, because you already have a lot of business logic in there, which is what you really want to map to that target model. And then once you do those mappings, right, now your result is going to be the, the, literally the physical mapping in R2RML in this case. Uh, so this is what that looks like, which is horrible, and I don't want you to learn that. That's why we create tools, so you can automatically do these mappings. Now, what's interesting is that uh, because we're, we can now reuse a lot of automatic techniques to do mappings between schemas. So when we do these mappings, we, we can generate them automatically. So the user now just has to go and make sure that what things was correct. So once the mappings are correct, created, now you got to use the mapping. So in your ETL process, I can have a mapping. And then I can run an ETL using these mappings. So, I mean, we're, we're a vendor in these tools, and you can, or people do write scripts for this stuff. Uh, and then you generate the RDF. And this RDF can now get loaded into a triple store. There's triple store vendors here, I know. The Stardog is one, for example. Then you can now run your Sparkle queries directly onto that triple store. Um, so in this case, you, are, you, you, you have a copy of the data, but now that data is also in terms of that target, which is FIBO. Um, now the other approach, the no ETL approach, is where, you know what, I have my relational data, and I have the mapping that I've created, but what really stands up is a virtual triple store. So you think it's a triple store, you can query it like a triple store, but it's not really a triple store. It's still your relational data, your relational database. So what happens is that you can now take a Sparkle query, you execute this, and this Sparkle query will be in terms of that target EKG, in terms of FIBO. And then internally, what the systems do is that they translate that using the mapping to SQL queries down to the database, and then you get your results back. So in this case, you think you're querying everything in terms of that target, but your data didn't have to move. Now, so what does this look like when you put it all together, um, right? You have your different uh, relational databases, all your different sources, and once you've created the mappings, you can set up, for example, these no ETL engines. And what this means is that now they're virtually basically a, a, a triple store, and now everything is a graph. Now, the cool thing about graphs uh, is that if I have two different graphs representing two different data sources, how do I get two graphs into one? I just start adding edges between nodes. And that's actually the reason why, in our experiences, that we see that adding edges between nodes is faster coming to when, when we want to do data integration. So by changing the representation of, the, of basically of the model from relational to graph, data integration just becomes faster. And, and, and we've just, by changing the representation, we've reduced the problem of data integration to finding edges between nodes. And that's a, that's a faster problem that we've seen. Uh, we've created tools which are much easier to just do, okay, hey, this, 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 is, this, this, this is one and one. So when I have different sources, then they're all graphs, I now can now query each one of them using Sparkle, for example, and now I view as if it were one giant graph, and I can now query that all together. So in this case, we were all federating the queries, and then we were pushing all the work down to where all the sources are, and then we've done all the work to make sure that performance is not an issue, uh, and you can have access in real time of your data without having to move it. Uh, and then now you can do all your reporting. But this, um, my, um, my point is that you, I'm not saying that you have to do it this way, right? You want to be have flexible, very be nimble, and have a, probably a hybrid approach where I can say, you know what, here are some data sources that I really need to access it in real time or because, and or because of security, privacy reasons, I can't move it. But there's other sort of data that I can, I can move. Right, either it's external open, open data or other information that's probably just stale, doesn't get updated that often, so I, and makes sense to physically have it all in the same place, or even for just analytical purposes, it's the results of some type of analytics. Uh, you can then ETL that and put it into a triple store. And then because the no ETL portion virtualizes your relational database as if it were a triple store, now you're all talking graphs. Doesn't matter if they're in the relational database or it's physically an RDF database. And now you can go continue and keep um, doing your reports. So one of the things that do come up is about, all about these mappings. And, and there is some work that needs to be done. But what we've realized is that 
uh, you don't have to boil the ocean when it comes to integrating all your data. So traditionally you say, well, I got to figure out what are all my sources I need to integrate, then I need to do all my enterprise schema, and then figure out all the ETL jobs, and then move all my data, then six months later, after a million dollars, I can now query it, then I realize I'm missing data, or this is the wrong data, and I can't get results, and everybody's saying, hey, what's going on? Well, we're ha because of this whole graph approach and very declarative, we can be very nimble to do things slow, start small and get bigger. So what we usually do with our clients is we tell them, just let's start with the small set of questions that you want to get answered, which are the hardest ones, the most expensive ones you can't do right now. And let's work on that. And that means that if you have an, on an EKG, we, can, we know what part we want to use. If you don't have one, we know what, what to start building. And then we look for the particular sources, and from those sources, what are the tables or the attributes that are needed to answer that. And you only create the mappings for that. And then you can write those and run those queries. Then you get answers back literally from basically from day one. So you start getting the value from this from the beginning instead of waiting all the way six months. So that's why even though mappings can, you need to have a lot of the business knowledge, understand people from the business, understand where the data is when it comes to the mappings. So obviously you can think that the easiest way is if things map one to one, right? Name is, first name is first name here and so forth. I mean, that's a, that's a simple cases, but there have, you have other things that say, hey, this, this couple things in the database can mean this different things in, the, in, in your target, right? So one thing here can mean many things, or many things here can mean one thing. And then you start having discussions with people saying, wait, no, but that's not, for me it's different, right? Uh, but for me it's another thing. And that's the good, that's good. That's the discussion you need to have because you realize that that's how you start probably extending your EKG, right? I mean, uh, in an e-commerce setting that we have, we say, what is an order, right? Depending on who you ask, an order is when somebody click checkout. On the, on, the, on, on the website. An order is when it, when it actually processed your credit card. An order is when you got delivered to your, to your home. So you ask different people, they, meet, they think about different things for the same word. Again, that's not about the word, it's the concept. So you start thinking about where is that in your data? So you can have different mappings and say, you know what, the join of all these tables, for example, will map to a particular attribute or concept in your database. So this is, these are the things that you have to think about from the conceptual point of view, and you look into the data to create the mappings. And then these mappings, you can write them in SQL, and it's all declarative, and the mapping language supports this. And at the same time, I can have uh, probably data values, right? Data values, but those things show up, uh, those concepts are concepts in the ontology, in the EKG, but in my database, they're data values, right? So it's data, metadata, but here everything is data and metadata, so you need to be able to, how do I reconcile those things? So, so these are examples of types of mappings that, that, that occur, uh, and all that are conversations that need to be happened, and, uh, and, and the standards all that support these types of mappings. So these are the things that we go through with our clients. Uh, when it happens, when you're thinking about, well, I'm hearing about FIBO, but my data is an Oracle, how do I put these two things together? So uh, these are the processes that you go through, and we've been having a lot of experience with that. So um, I'm going to pass it on back to, to, to Mike to say, well, once you've actually mapped things together, what are the types of, of reporting? Now on top, the applications, what do you do? Back to Mike. Thanks. So you can see why we're excited about this stuff. You know, we created a common language because the industry said, you know, we need a common language. We don't need another bunch of XML messaging, you know, there's lots of those, but we need common language. We said, great, okay, we've done one, we've focused on meaning, what do we do with it? Ah, oh, well, um, yes, we need to integrate, how do we integrate? So seeing a practical solution like this, which takes a business-facing model where the business owns the meaning, remember that's one of those key requirements in Basel, that the different business units are responsible for the meaning of the data, and they own the reports and they own the management dashboards and things, and being able to put that directly to work in technology without any sort of uh, um, sort of uh, impedance mismatch, as it were, with IT is extremely exciting. So let's let's close the loop and show how we pull this together now. So the Basel requirement that I mentioned, BCBS 239, it requires you to report very flexibly. It also requires that you can prove that the things that management's looking at when they're dealing with risk are timely and up to date and are indeed the same things as you sent to the regulator and not some other thing that you made up. And so being able to make meaningful semantic queries and ping them into a meaningful model of business meanings, which is the ontology, where you virtualize the knowledge graph, 
means that now you can meet quite a large part of BCBS 239 because you can demonstrate that what the management is seeing is the real thing. You've, by not having to stand up triple stores except for particular applications where you need them, the data that's been managed and has been gone through all the processes you've built up for BCBS compliance, you've shown all your data governance and so on, all that wouldn't be much good if you then said, ah, oh, but we actually reported on this data over here in this triple store. So that's different data. You can prove that you're reporting on the very data that you've put all your data governance measures around and that what management is seeing in their dashboards and so on is a real reflection of the data that you've put all this uh, new effort into uh, um, uh, 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 looking after and, and doing the, the data quality and, 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 uh, and governance and so on. Um, and if you've got a new query, a new risk factor that comes up, a new thing you want to see, it's just a new Sparkle query in technical terms, a new semantic query as far as the business people are concerned. And there's lots of tools and techniques for doing that. Um, and similarly for reporting, you can show that your reporting is timely and accurate. You're reporting against real data that's right there. Um, you know, if you want to draw inferences from it, you ETL that into a triple store to draw new inferences like we saw about counterparty exposures and you know, transitive exposures across uh, networks of types of entity and so on. Um, and you can create new reports without, you know, building a whole lot of new technology. Again, it's just an update to the Sparkle query. So it kind of takes IT out of the loop. IT has a function. Their function is to look after all that stuff. But getting the information out in a timely way becomes a business problem with a business solution thanks to the kind of technology that we're seeing now that allows you to virtualize your data and uh, essentially provide, with minimum application development, the ability to extend and vary the uh, reports that you need to do. And it's non-disruptive, so you're using existing systems of record, existing data quality measures. So very exciting, as we say. I'm very uh, uh, happy to be working with these guys. So. Um, the takeaway then, as you heard from the beginning, is uh, banks can, can demonstrate BCBS 239 compliant risk reporting without disruption by using FIBO and semantic data virtualization. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Okay. So the slides, I sent them a couple hours ago, so they should be online soon. Uh, and uh, so the question is, what is the performance uh, it, with this type of solution uh, with large amounts of data and large amounts of mappings? So um, the answer to that is that for our tool, which our tool is called UltraRap, uh, we scale as well as your underlying relational database scales. So a lot of the, all the science and technology that came out and actually kept sent as a spin out from the University of Texas in com the computer science department. So I started the company after I did my PhD there. And what we studied and what we figured out was how do you take the semantic query over a type of wrapper system and you take that same exact English definition of a query and you write it in SQL to your database and the queries are basically the the execution speeds are practically the same. And actually, more often than not, you look at the physical query plans, they're literally they're, they're the same. So we crafted a system where we took advantage of 30 plus years of, of optimizations from the database and we pushed everything down to the database. Um, so, we, so the answer is we scale as best as your underlying relational database scales. Yeah, like I'll, I'll, I can send you further. Yeah. Question in the back. Yeah, so it's probably on top. Yeah. So, um, so the question is that there, there's other tools out there like, like ours, and there's an open source tool. Uh, and, and this question is that if you don't have refresh, referential integrity constraints, uh, can you still do the mapping? The answer is yes. So uh, what we do underneath the hood is we extract basically an, an ontology from your relational database, and then you have your target. And with this, we now have two ontologies. And now we use existing ontology matching techniques to help you automate that. So it's just to help you get closer to the end. Uh, if the referential integrity constraints are basically semantics in your database. So if you have them, great, we'll take advantage of them. If you don't have them, don't worry. Then there's probably extra work that needs to be done, but it can still be done. Okay, the last question. Yeah, 
yes, so we do support federated queries. Uh, we have a reasoning coming in from our lab in, inside, uh, so we already support uh, subclasses that we'll, we'll be doing inside. Uh, the, again, that's probably a scenario. To, we, the question is how much of reasoning is needed? And if, if you need a lot of expressivity reasoning, that may be, I mean, that'll tell you have QL, RL, and EL, right? So it, it's, in, in a lot of the work that we've done, the scientific work is that you can push down to the database, which is um, what's called RDFS plus, right? So sub property, sub class, which means equivalent cl class, equivalent property, uh, transitivity, symmetric. So that's stuff that we have in the pipeline to, to implement, um, but we, It, so it may depend on the type of query that you do that, that you can push, that, that if they don't conflict with each other, then you can do that. But if you have to do reasoning, that is a scenario where you want to have the hybrid and then do ETL for some part. So. And then use your own tools to do whatever exactly. you want to do. You know? And that way, using semantic web applications is a matter of here's a use case where a reasoning application will stand up this triple store to do exactly this. And you know, so yeah. not all use cases need reasoning, exactly. right? And so if you're doing just plain data integration, I mean, you may not need reasoning for things. So it really depends on your use case. Okay, okay. let's well, give these guys a hand.